In this video I'm going to easily visually display to you what is going on with the octahedron and the way in which we see the celestial sphere. Remember I mentioned before that the octahedron acts as a resonant absorptive antenna. If you look at radiation patterns of dipole antennas it has the same dipole effect where it is splitting the circle in two and we see the same type of pattern there with our eyes our eyes wherever we are within the inside of the earth whatever latitude we're at in this case we're at 45 degrees north our eyes are always going to carry it to the center and it will figuratively split the celestial sphere into two and so the half that is facing you flips in curvature and it appears as if that side creates a dome over your head it's not a real dome it's a virtual dome but that is the way that light operates, that energy operates, that electricity operates within the earth. That resonant absorptive energy that sucks the light up toward the center will always intersect the celestial sphere perpendicularly. That is what creates the sun and the moon inversion. We think the sun is straight across, however it is curled upward and inverted. Light is always bending up toward the center wherever you are within the earth. Horizontal dipole radio energy will always bend upward from the ground. This is the illusion that the secret of the universe holds. When you look at a nebula, let's use a regular atmospheric cloud for a reference object. Which dimension seems more believable? 50 million light years across? or about the size of a cloud. Nebula means cloud. The truth is hidden in plain sight. The stars are close. They have to be close. The concept of light years is fiction. They have to conjure up prodigious distances in order for their model to work. But common sense tells you it cannot work. We see the stars. The stars are close, very close. The stars are small, very small. The stars are behind glass. The glass has a bumpy surface to it, damaged after the flood. Glass causes chromatic aberration. The different fringing of the bumpy surface causes different redshift readings. Redshift of galaxies is simply chromatic aberration of the glass encompassing the stars. The spiral pattern of galaxies are simply indications of drainage. The celestial sphere contained water. The water came pouring out when the windows of heaven were opened. Stars are formed by a process of sonoluminescence, extremely hot sound bubbles. Because they are bubbles, there is not much mass detected in stars, but rather mass is detected in the area surrounding the stars, otherwise known as dark matter. Dark matter is simply dark waters or liquids as recorded in the scriptures and confirmed in recent scientific studies. During the time of the flood, the stars clustered together and they melted holes through the glass firmament. Water and sand came pouring down to earth. Because of the frigid temperatures, the windows of heaven congealed back together, leaving a spiral remnant of the drainage. Hidden in plain sight, the glass is detected by comets. In photography, a glass anomaly is created by the lens called coma aberration, named after a comet. 
when we view a comet in the sky, it is because the sunlight is hitting the comet at an oblique angle as it is immersed in the plasma field above the glass. There is birefringence to the glass, which splits the tail in two. Sagittal astigmatism, tangential astigmatism, coma aberration are all clear indications that there is glass in the sky hidden in plain sight. The curvature of the comet's tail is a clear indication that light is bending. It should not be any surprise to anyone that they had found Star Trek-like invisible shields thousands of miles above Earth, where they say it's almost like these electrons are running into a glass wall in space. But there is most likely at least three concentric spheres of glass in the Earth apart from the main celestial sphere. This is detected easily by viewing the 22nd degree halo and the 46th degree halo and understanding that there is a much lower glass at approximately 100 kilometers. Hidden in plain sight once again, we can understand that there is glass at 100 kilometers based upon upper atmospheric lightning hitting a ceiling at 100 kilometers. We also can understand that auroras bottom out at 100 kilometers. Radio wave propagation propagates, reflects off the ionosphere at 100 kilometers. The height of the Schumann resonance is at 100 kilometers. Scientists say that sporadic meteoroids are bouncing off the atmosphere, the sporadic E layer of the ionosphere, the neutral density layer of the ionosphere, like bugs hitting a windshield at 100 kilometers. Coincidence? It's plowing up this, this debris, yeah. just like a bug on a windshield effect. Oh, bug on. Just like a bug on a windshield effect. Just like a bug on a windshield effect. <laughs> but to a child, a simple rainbow would suffice in having them understand that there is glass above. As the sunlight disperses through the glass, it gets projected onto reflective water droplets. The water droplets are not the source of the rainbow, but merely the reflective canvas of the already glass dispersed light. Okay, I wanted to show you something that you've never seen before. Um, the only thing that's close to this is my video, and uh, it was incredibly popular. It uh, still gets a comment on a lot, but most people don't know what's going on. They'll uh, make descriptions talking about eddy currents and lens laws, but the one of the biggest mistakes of human stupidity, and basically in all branches of science, is this. And that is, descriptions are not explanations. Okay? So what we have here is a compass. It's actually a precision compass, rather than expensive. And of course, we have a huge honking neodymium uh, iron boron magnet here. And it's just an enormous $1,000 beast. Here I have magnetic viewing film here. You can see the dielectric inertial plane of the magnet. So what I'm going to do right now is the only way you'll be able to see this is using an enormous, expensive magnet like this is that uh, you never will see it in a small one because you don't have enough, uh, enough uh, surface area to see the fact that there's a huge zone difference between the centrifugal and the centripetal edge like this. So let me spin up the brass flywheel on uh, this gyroscope and we'll take a look at something. Uh, Dremel tool and I'm going to place it right at the centripetal convergent center of this magnet. You could hear it spinning, revving up really high. I'm going to try to hold it really stationary, which of course I can't hold it perfectly stationary. Of course, I could let go of it for a second too, but I don't want to do that. I want to show you something important. Now, what's happening is I have this flywheel positioned dead center, or mostly dead center, over the centrifugal, excuse me, the centripetal convergent vortex. And you're able to see this vortex with a feral cell. Okay, I explain this in my book, Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism, which is free, by the way. I'm working on the fourth edition. It's currently in the third edition. This sucker will spin and spin and spin and spin until you're so bored that you wouldn't want to watch this damn video anymore. Okay? Spin and spin. It just spins, spin, 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 spin. So now, 
Let's place it at the centrifugal divergent edge and watch what happens. Not touching it. Boom. Immediate braking. I think I accidentally did tap it right there at the very end. So. The lift force and the sink force of the electromagnetic flux. There's an inversely proportional relationship between the two. Blue arrows represent the centripetal convergent lift force. It draws objects to the center where the current is attracted to the moving convex surface of the celestial sphere. The lift force is stronger in the center and weaker at the edge. That is why planets have such an easy time staying aloft toward the center, because there's not that much sink force and plenty of lift force. If it weren't for the magnetic sun attracting the planets, they probably would crash into the celestial sphere. The lift force cohabitates with the centrifugal sink force, which has the inverse proportion effect. The sink force is the either push force we all experience on the Earth or in the Earth. As it moves, the divergent fluxes, but the brakes on the Earth preventing any rotation. Remember Wheeler's gyroscope on his huge neodymium iron-borne magnet? The centripetal lift force perpetuated the magnet in a viscous free flux near the center. Yet the centrifugal divergent sink force stopped the gyro on the edge. That's what's happening with the Earth. The sink force generates a depression to the west. That's why bullets sink to the west and rise to the east, because there's a greater clamping down effect for projectiles shot into the downstream of the sink force. This is also what causes eastward deflection of flying objects. They seek the least resistance, which will always be found eastward of the meridian. The sink force is so strong at the edge it holds the water at bay. The ether sink force eliminates the Coriolis or the Atmos effect from being the cause of this phenomenon. Since you should know by now, we are not on a rotating planet. Now we can understand what causes gyroscopes to liberate themselves from the thick sink force happening at the edge. The rotation of the gyro is stripping off its sink force hold and aligning itself with a much weaker lift force at that level to allow it to rise. The vertical axis seeks to magnetically align itself with the central octahedron. That's why the airplane gyro stays pretty much vertical wherever it flies within the Earth. There is curvature, but since light bends up, you don't really detect it that well. So when you say show me the curvature, I say show me your intelligence. Show me your intuition. Show me that you cannot get fooled again.
really. Jefferson Aviation Naturals indicate concavity to the Earth. Notice the latitude lines are all frowning. That's because a satellite, which is situated at the equator, is simply pointing down inside. These satellites are hovering at these geostationary equilibrium points because there's a giant concave magnet in the center of the Earth. What connection is there between a total solar eclipse and the rotation of the Earth, if there is a rotation of the Earth, it makes no sense. It's got to be another force that's perpetuating the pendulum, and that is the ether force. And so when the moon obstructed the sun, it changed the way that the ether was hitting the Earth. There was a dis disruption, there was a disturbance within the ether when the eclipse happened. And another thing about the solid Earth is they have to figure out why the P waves are reaching the other side of the Earth uh, a lot later than they should. And so basically they're saying that during a while, that's why they create this, this outer core. <laughs> they're saying that there's higher elasticity there. It's not necessarily a lower density. It's just all theory, conjecture, and bullshit. is actually just glass. It's an insulator. Okay, the Earth is one big capacitor. Look at that. It's hitting a wall. It's hitting the glass guy. And there's a gap between the electromagnetic forces from above the glass versus the ground. And the glass is the insulator. And so the lightning bridges that gap just like in a plasma ball. If you don't have a hard surface to the ionosphere, and it's just a field of plasma, those RF waves are going to just be absorbed. And that's what we have in your model. It doesn't make sense. You need a hard surface. Therefore, they have to give you different layers of it. And that's dependent upon the frequency. The level of absorbance is greater when the wavelength is shorter. So that's what they're failing to tell you. It's just a faulty presupposition.
appearance from the cosmic rays entangle with the comet like in the back of the sun, it actually slows it down. So that's what we're that's what we're getting. centrifugal ether force. So this ether explains everything that you think gravity explains. But the ether explains it better.
they don't know how the sun works. It's not burning anything. There's no fusion in the sun. That's well understood. There's nothing inside. Foundations of the Earth. That's why there is an active neutron in the center, and it can't be picked up with Canadian meteor orbit radar. Inside the center, the center of the octahedron. And so somehow, once they were formed, they shot up, or shot up north, or shot up south, out of the south, out of the octahedron, and they began to orbit around the celestial sphere. These so-called plasma tubes that they're detecting are all pointing to 33 degrees. That's where all activity is starting from. That's how it's illuminating. That's how it's powering the sun. And so you can actually even think about these, um, what she thinks are plasma tubules, but actually it's the source of light, it's the source of energy, it's the source of the ether. When we look at the cosmic rays hitting the Earth, <laughs> this, is how they, this is how it's depicted. You guys have light detectors and charged particle detectors on the ground. And they're always observing a convergence as you go up. It's not because it's a perspective, and that cannot work. Obviously, if you look at the comics ball, there would be a positive meniscus on your head, which would converge. So, the origin of these cosmic rays are coming from the north sides of the north. And they pass through this high vacuum state of this glass door effect, and they increase in velocity. It emanates out in all directions. It looks for an opening. And we have Cygnus X going right through it because the Milky Way band is a little bit thinner and it allows those cosmic rays to be penetrated through the celestial sphere. It's not actually coming from the stars. The stars are just tiny little solar luminescent bubbles. 